uh, introduce uh, Urvasi. Uh, Urvasi is a uh, Raman Research Institute. Raman Research Institute, heading the Quantum Information and Computing Laboratory at RRI. Uh, she is the Simon's Emmy Leader Mother Fellow at the Perry Leader Institute of Canada, as well as an Associate Faculty Member at the Institute for Quantum Computing, um, University of Waterloo and the Center for Quantum Information and Quantum Control, University of Toronto, both in Canada. She completed her MSc and PhD at Cambridge University on experiments in high temperature superconductivity. She's been a Gates Cambridge scholar during her PhD and a Nehru Shevening scholar during her master's. She was a postdoctoral research associate in the Cavendish Labs, Cambridge, as well as at IQC Canada. Uh, her lab with RRI specializes in experiments on photonic quantum information processing, including memory using, using single and entangled photons. She's heading India's first project on satellite-based secure quantum communications. Um, so some really cool things, uh, from some really cool scientific recognitions include the Honey Baba Fellowship in the year 2017, as well as the 2018 ICTB ICO the DNO Bernardo Award in Optics. She was recognized as one of Asia's top 100 scientists by the Asian Scientist for the year 2019, and she won the Asutham Roman in Cyber, making a difference award in the category Cyber Leading from the Front in 2021. So, uh, Urushi, please go ahead uh, and we look forward to your talk. Thanks a lot, Akshay, for this very kind introduction. Can you hear me still well? Yes, I can hear. Yeah, you. yeah. So I'll just share my screen and uh, ensure that things are uh, works fine, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So well, first of all, uh, thanks Akshay, Apurva, and the rest of the uh, you know people at IQTI and Sri Vidya for uh, you know inviting me for this uh, seminar today. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to talk to you today, and of course. Um, yeah, so uh, as was said, the topic is on revealing new facets in experimental quantum information processing with photons. And what uh, I have uh, chosen to do is that I, uh, the talk is divided into two parts. The first part deals with a certain experiment on the loophole free violation of the legged garg inequalities. And the second part is uh, deals with new results in higher dimensional quantum information processing. Uh, from what I can see, I think the first part will be uh, slightly longer than the second part, but uh, that is how the talk will be. But then uh, before I move on to these main topics, I just, uh, you know, for the uninitiated who do not really know our work or our lab, wanted to give a little overview of the other work, you know, the various genre of experiments that we are working on before moving on to the uh, main focus topics. So uh, ours is a quantum optics lab which is also a class 10,000 clean room. So we have precise control on temperature and humidity. And uh, we are working on, you know, different uh, research topics related to quantum information, computation and communication. And of course, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a lab website. So today I'll be focusing on, you know, basically very, uh, just very niche um, topics that I'll discuss in detail. So if you are interested in our work, do visit the website for, you know, understanding and uh, learning more about the stuff we do. Uh, of course, you know, uh, lab uh, is incomplete without the people who work in the lab and what we do with equi equipment if, you know, we don't have people. And so we are very, very lucky and um, happy and honored that we have so many uh, bright young people who uh, have supported us uh, earlier and who are supporting us now in various uh, experiments uh, and theoretical ideas that we are working on. And this is a snapshot of experiments as they happen. And of course, now with COVID relaxing a little bit, I'll be happy to, you know, uh, welcome people if they want to visit the lab and so on. OK, so the first, uh, you know, uh, genre of experiments and uh, here, yeah, can you hear me? Just to interrupt, yeah. Yeah. yeah, just to make a general announcement. If yeah. uh, the audience has questions, please use the raise hand button and I will call on you to unmute yourself. Please don't unmute yourself uh, automatically, all right? 
Uh, please, Professor. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Akshay. So uh, the first, uh, you know, uh, topic that we spend a lot of time and energy on is fundamental tests of quantum mechanics. Well, you know, various principles of quantum mechanics, putting precision bounds on these. And, and here you see a series of work that we have done on, uh, you know, uh, theoretically proposing and experimentally measuring a correction term to the superposition principle in interference experiments. As you know, this is the bedrock for quantum computing. Uh, as an application, right? And so this is the first experiment that was uh, done uh, to test this uh, using classical microwaves. On the right, uh, you know, there is a snapshot of uh, experiments that we have done in the fundamental quantum optics domain. Uh, while the first two are also very interesting, today's talk will have a lot of focus on the third one, which is one of our recent results on uh, the legged guard inequalities. Um, of course, we work on different aspects of entanglement, uh, entanglement measures, you know, static properties of entanglement as well as studies of entanglement dynamics. OK, and this is an experiment that is ongoing in the lab uh, where we are studying uh, the manipulation of what is called entanglement sudden death. So essentially entanglement degrades as it, as it interacts with the environment and it can drop to zero at a finite time. And so what we have done in here, we have the proposal for how we can manipulate it uh, to make it happen later or not at all. And uh, we are also almost done with the experimental proof of concept of the same, which would be very interesting for other, you know, um, solid state and other communities to pick up on and employ in their setup so that they can use the entanglement for longer. Another genre is in the domain of generalized measurements or weak measurements as a tool. And uh, again, a talk by itself, so I will uh, skip the details, but it suffices to say that this is a tool by which you can actually know more about what is happening to a system between preparation and measurement, which seems a bit counterintuitive if you think about the uh, strong von Neumann approach to you know, quantum mechanics, where we are not allowed to do much in between preparation and measurement. But here, in a statistical ensemble sense, we can actually do certain measurements by which we can gain more information in between preparation and measurement. And in fact, one of the experiments we have done is uh, measuring the expectation value of a non-Hermitian operator in the lab, which, as you would know, is uh, something that you usually wouldn't think of because operators are usually Hermitian and because the eigenvalues are real and so on. But here, you, by measuring weak values, we can do that. And in fact, uh, this uh, is the experiment where we've done that. Okay. Um, this is, uh, I mean, you know, again, part of it is going to be covered towards the latter part of my talk, which is on our approach uh, to higher dimensional quantum information, where we are, you know, working on problems in different domains in computing uh, communications and information processing. And, uh, you know, this is uh, the, this is something I will be talking about anyway. And these two very recent results uh, I will be talking about towards the latter part of my talk. OK, another uh, area in which we are doing a lot of work is in the domain of quantum communications. And as Akshay mentioned, we are working on an, a project called quantum experiments using satellite technology, which is a collaboration between RRI and ISRO, uh, which happens to be India's first project on satellite based QKD. We're working on integrated photonics based approaches under the India Tento, uh, Trento program on advanced research, which is an Indo-Italian bilateral program. Uh, under the DST Quest program, we are working on experimental quantum teleportation, uh, relays and repeater technologies. And we have this project under the Center for Excellence in Quantum Technologies from MIT, uh, which of course is a tri-institutional project with IISC and CDAC. And here we are working on device independent random number generation. This is a general overview, okay? So before I move on to uh, the plan for the talk, which is of course focused on very few of these things that I have just told you about. Uh, first part will deal with the first experimental loophole free violation of the legged garg inequalities. Uh, then I will go on to discuss uh, the direct determination of different entanglement monotones used to quantify entanglement in arbitrary system dimensions using only one pair of complementary observables. And I'll also show you a little bit about how we have done the first experimental proof of concept uh, for this technique that we have devised by using bipartite q traits in the lab. OK, so I move on to the first part of the talk, which is on uh, the experimental loophole free violation of the legged garg inequalities. Um, before I actually go on to discussing, you know, what this is about and so on, I just wanted to share a little bit, you know, uh, some thoughts which I think, you know, some members of the audience may actually share. Um, 
several years ago, you know, when I was not quite working on these uh, ideas, you know, whether it is entanglement, bell inequality violation, and now over the last few years on Legit Garg inequality, uh, you know, I like many of you perhaps in the audience, uh, somehow sometimes had this notion that, you know, some of these concepts that I hear about and that I read about are uh, actually have uh, much deeper implications than perhaps what even I'm able to understand. OK, so maybe sometimes, you know, there is this underlying notion that, uh, you know, some of it is even philosophy and not science. OK, and and, and in fact, uh, there, are, you know, you can think like that if you're not quite, you know, privy to what it actually entails and what, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and you're working in the domain. And so this is something that many people are perhaps guilty of this sort of a thought. But then now over the last several years that I have been actually working with uh, you know, an experimental uh, scenario where I'm working with entanglement, uh, you know, showing Bell inequality violation in the lab. And of course, the topic for today's talk uh, is on the legged guard inequality. I realize that, you know, uh, this is absolutely as real as it gets, so to speak. OK, so it's an experiment which has its eureka moments and then it also has these frustrations, which of course far out live. I mean, I would say there are much more frustrating moments than the Eureka moments because things usually don't work ex in experiments as you're aware of in the beginning. And so uh, all this is very real and these violations actually happen and they have very, very, uh, you know, deep implications. So it's a fascinating area to actually work on if you are, especially if you're an experimentalist, because you can see this happen in the lab and uh, work on something which has this, you know, very deep fundamental implications, but also lays the foundation for cutting edge technological applications, which again we are working on as well, right? Whether it's quantum information, quantum communications, these are all the applications of these very fundamental ideas. So it's really very um, fascinating uh, as, a, as a genre to uh, invest time in. And um, so what I would begin with is, you know, some very basic, quantum questions, which if I as I would you know, raise them, you would think that, yeah, this this seems a very normal question to ask. So the first is we know that, you know, quantum mechanics, of course, has non classical features naturally, right? So it's quantum mechanics, so it's not classical. So what do these non classical features reveal about the nature of physical reality? So while I'm sitting here, you know, in my, you know, home office and giving a talk uh, to you through my computer. I mean, you know, this is physical reality, but then here we have quantum mechanics with its non-classical features. What does it reveal about what we may say is physical reality? OK, secondly, how to reconcile our everyday experience of what we would say is the macroscopic world, right? Because we are all we definitely do not uh, think of ourselves as quantum particles. So we are a part of what we may say is a macroscopic world. So how do we reconcile our everyday experience with the, let's say, the quote unquote weird behavior of the microphysical world de described by quantum mechanics? OK, and so to what extent is it possible to test quantum mechanics in the macro limit? So now, you know, these are all very, you know, legitimate questions to ask. And of course, they should have an answer. And what is very nice is, you know, uh, there are so many great minds who have thought so much about these things. They have beautiful theories, wonderful experiments. So a lot of what I will do is in fact borrow from these uh, great minds and try and present to you a coherent story about you know how all these things make sense and how it leads to the experiment that we have done, which is a loophole free violation of a certain inequality. OK, so I uh, definitely, you know, there is so much that has happened that uh, it is a matter of actually, uh, you know, borrowing from uh, the greats, right? So what is then realism? Of course, as you may appreciate, um, uh, realism is the main topic uh, and this is what we would uh, sort of uh, violate by this uh, experiment that I will uh, talk to you about. So what is realism? OK, so the classical realist worldview states that a system is in a definite state for which all its observable properties have definite values independent of measurement. Now this is a very uh, easy statement to understand. So I'm sitting here, I have a window in front of me and I can actually see a tree outside with green leaves and these beautiful you know, flowers that bloom at this time of the year in Bangalore. So this is what, you know, uh, these are the properties of that tree. And so now if I were to go to the other room, my expectation will be that this tree with its leaves and flowers will still exist, 
right? And so independent of the act of my looking at the tree, which is in this case the measurement, uh, this is what uh, this tree would have a definite state, okay, with all its observable properties having definite values. So this is something which we understand, right? Because this is what we see around us, so to speak. But unlike a classical state, the specification of a quantum state does not in general give the values of the dynamical variables possessed by a system. So thus in general, a dynamical variable is taken to have no definite measurement independent value. As opposed to what I said in the first bullet point, a quantum state you know, does not have any values associated with these variables, which is independent of the measurement that you do. So in other words, a measurement cannot, according to, I mean, a measurement according to quantum mechanics in general, does not reveal a pre-existent value of a dynamical variable. So when you measure, then you see the value of the variable that you, that emerges as an act of that measurement. So it's dependent on that measurement. It does not have a pre-existent value. Okay. Now this is something rather counterintuitive to the first bullet point, which you know is something we can all appreciate, right? And in fact, someone like Albert Einstein actually, you know, this is a quote that is famously attributed to him that I like to think the moon is there even if I'm not looking at it, which is, you know, same as my tree outside the window. So this is what sort of makes sense to us, right? But then this is not what happens uh, in the quantum scenario or, you know, in the microscopic world uh, at that time. Okay? And so uh, this is uh, what is, you know, counterintuitive. And of course, um, going, you know, I would like to take an example that I've always very much liked to uh, further motivate this particular point. And this is on uh, Bertelmann's socks and the nature of reality. And this was a beautiful paper written by John Bell here. OK, and uh, I would uh, quote from that paper, basically the introduction. So the philosopher in the street who has not suffered a course in quantum mechanics is quite unimpressed by Einstein Podolsky Rosen correlations. OK, he can point to many examples of similar correlations in everyday life. The case of Bertelmann's socks is often cited. So jo Reinhold Bertelmann was uh, actually a colleague of John Bell and they were together in CERN, much younger colleague. Okay, and so they have a lot of work together and they were great friends. And so this is referring to his socks. Okay? <laughs> Dr. Bertelmann likes to wear two socks of different colors. Which color he will have on a given foot on a day, given day is quite unpredictable. Okay, but when you see this figure one from Bell's paper, that the first sock is pink, you can be already sure that the second sock will not be pink. Observation of the first and experience of Bertelmann gives immediate information about the second, right? So if the first sock is pink, the second is definitely not pink because that is what John, uh, Reinhold Bertelmann did. He wore socks which were mismatched, apparently for some, for some 60s revolution that he was a party to, okay? There is no accounting for taste, but apart from that, there is no mystery here. And is not the EPR business just the same? In fact, you know, when John Bell asked this question and you pause and think about what you know about these EPR, uh, you know, experiments and, you know, EPR uh, paradox and so on, you basically think that, yeah, maybe, I mean, you know, it's perhaps the same. I mean, you know, here also we say, okay, if one is up, the other is down and so on and so forth. So really, where is the difference? And if indeed it is, as simple as a pair of mismatched socks, why is there so much uh, discussion about it, right? And of course, the answer to this question is it is not the same. And the rest of the paper, which is again something students should definitely have a look at, uh, tells you through various interesting examples using the sock, how you can derive this inequality and, and then you can show that it is in fact definitely not the same, in fact the opposite, okay? And this is uh, Reinhold Bertelmann showing his socks. Uh, he's he's a professor in Vienna uh, still. OK, and this was in 2017 and you can clearly see his mismatched socks, which we have reference to in John Bell's uh, seminal paper. OK, now I go on to another paper by uh, Tony Leggett himself. OK, and of course here again, I'm still uh, talking to you about the Bell inequality experiments, trying to tell you what happens there. So the best known set of experiments which examine the question of realism are those which stem from the theoretical work of Einstein et al. and of Bell. Okay? That's of course Einstein et al. is the EPR paradox paper and John Bell's work and are usually known as EPR Bell experiments. They refer to measurements made on a pair of systems which have interacted in the past 
but are now separated to a distance such that according to the postulates of special relativity, the outcome of a measurement as one system cannot be causally influenced by the choice of what to measure on the other. And this is what sums up the EPR Bell experiments. You have this pair which are separated from each other and spatially separated, right? So that the outcome of one cannot have a, uh, an influence on the choice of what to measure on the other. OK, and so this is from Bertelmann's very nice uh, overview in physics today where, you know, this is what happens in uh, the EPR Bell experiments. So John Bell's famous inequality was derived from the setup illustrated here. So you have a pair of spin half particles and they are prepared in a state of zero angular momentum and each propagates freely in opposite directions to the measuring stations. We call them Alice and Bob. So Alice measures the spin in a direction A while Bob simultaneously measures in a direction B. Very important word simultaneously. There is no way in which Alice will do a measurement and then send some information to Bob on the basis of which he will choose his settings. No, this happens simultaneously. And so there is no way in which one influences the other. Okay. Now, if you have what is called the hidden variable theory, which is of course, you know, what is a local realist theory as we call it. So there are these hidden variables which, uh, you know, predetermine what would happen to these measurement outcomes. So this is uh, what we would of course uh, violate, right? So in this hidden variable theory, the measurement results are predetermined. The hidden variables might decree, for example, that if Alice measures her spin up, Bob will measure his down, okay? And uh, so this is uh, what happens in these EPR Bell experiments. And in fact, this is Bertelmann and Bell sharing a cup of afternoon tea. OK, and so now uh, uh, from uh, um, uh, Tony Leggett's paper. So if you zoom in a little bit and you know, if you think about what is happening, you have this pair of particles. One of them goes to this Alice station. The other goes to the Bob. Here you have a random switch, okay? a switch which randomly selects which measurement base, uh, you know, to send this particle to, whether it's the MA apparatus or the MA prime. Okay? Similarly, on the B side, you have the MB and the MB prime. So this is done randomly. Yeah? And so now if I zoom in on this MA, uh, usually this is the scenario if it's, let's say, um, you know, a photon with a polarization degree of freedom. So you have a beam splitter here. So sometimes it transmits the photon, sometimes it reflects the photon. So if it transmits, then you have uh, the, you know, the result DA plus, and if it reflects, then it's DA minus. So in fact, as you can understand that each of these will have either a plus or a minus, plus or a minus. And so if I take one such uh, sub ensemble for my experiment, which I call AB, OK, so this is when MA and MB are the ones which are uh, coming into the picture. Then I can define this sort of a ratio, which is about the number where we have plus 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 the so this is the joint probabilities of this being plus, this being plus, this being minus, this being minus, plus minus and minus plus. OK, so this is one such. And of course, we can form four such because, you know, you can have AB, AB prime, A prime B, A prime B prime and then by using this assumption of local realism, and of course I won't uh, show you the definition in, the, in this talk, but uh, it comes from simple algebra that if you assume that you know these uh, observables have predetermined values and that there are local hidden variables which are governing this predetermined values, which are called these objective local theories, then you can show that you can construct this inequality which would always be less than or equal to two. OK, so this is uh, what is called the Bell inequality and this Bell inequality uh, is an inequality which says that this sum and difference of these joint probability measurements is always going to be less than or equal to two. And this is what would happen if you are basing this on objective, <coughs> excuse me, local theories. OK. Now, Bertelmann goes on to say that, you know, when he derived Bell's inequality for the first time, uh, he was really impressed that it was possible to discriminate between all hidden variable theories and quantum mechanics. How did John find his special combination of expectation values that contradicted quantum mechanics for certain sets of measurements? For me as a theorist, the job was done. However, nevertheless, experiment had to decide which was right, hidden variable theory or quantum mechanics. Of course, you know, till now we have seen that by actually using certain assumptions, which we call objective local um, theories, we can actually derive the uh, Bell inequality. And of course, if you satisfy Bell inequality, then you have proven that uh, local realism is correct. And if you violate it, then of course 
you would prove that you would disprove local realism and quantum mechanics is one theory which would satisfy that. OK, but now, of course, this is all theory so far. We need actual experiments to see which one uh, works out in the lab, because of course that is what forms the basis for uh, various things thereafter. So the classic experiments, the first one who became interested in these Bell inequalities was John Clauser in the late 1960s. And in fact, uh, Bertelmann says that at that time, working in the field was a courageous act. Clauser relates, for example, how he once had an appointment with Richard Feynman to discuss an experimental EPR configuration, you know, for testing the predictions of quantum mechanics. Feynman immediately threw him out of the office, saying, well, when you found an error in quantum theory's experimental predictions, come back then and we can discuss your problem with it. So in fact, this summarizes the kind of notion that existed at that time towards doing such experiments. OK, fortunately, Clauser remained stubborn and with Stuart Friedman carried out the experiment in 1972. The outcome is well known, right? The results were in accord with quantum theory and in clear violation of a Bell inequality. Later experiments, notably by Edward Fry and Randall Thompson, confirmed the result. Okay. Then the 1980s saw a second generation of Bell experiments carried out, in particular by Alan Aspe and his group. Aspe and colleagues worked with polarized photons, okay, and their goal was to incorporate a fast switch mechanism, just like I described, you know, this fast switch between the random selection of faces for the polarizers to exclude a possible mutual influence between the two observers, Alice and Bob. Again, a Bell inequality was significantly violated, and again, experimental results agreed with quantum mechanics predictions. So in my opinion, which of course is Bertelmann's opinion, the Aspe work was a turning point. The physics community began to realize that such explorations were getting at something essential and research started into what is nowadays called quantum information and quantum communication, a flourishing field. So see, this is the trajectory. So you start with asking some great people started with asking some fundamental questions, came up with a theory which, you know, could be experimentally, uh, you know, uh, measured in the lab and then we have this conclusion which of course is the basis for technological applications which we are all very familiar with okay and in fact uh, the bell inequality 50 years later if you see this very nice blog by uh, john preskill in the, on the caltech website you know he goes on to say how this work has revolutionized the field of physics as we know it so the, you know it's about the paper john bell submitted about entanglement and of course, you know, this we have just seen. But why is that such a big deal? Bell showed that a quantum system is more than just a probabilistic classical system, which eventually led to the realization that accurately predicting the behavior of highly entangled quantum system is beyond the capacity of ordinary digital computers. Therefore, physicists are now striving to scale up the weirdness of the microscopic world to larger and larger scales eagerly seeking new phenomena and unprecedented technological capabilities. Okay, so 1964 was a good year. It was not just about the Bell paper. Higgs and others described Higgs mechanism. Gelman and Zwig proposed the quark model. Panzias and Wilson discovered the cosmic microwave background. And well, he says that he saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan's show. These developments continue to reverberate 50 years later. Okay, but Bell's legacy is that quantum entanglement is becoming an increasingly pervasive theme of contemporary physics, important not just as a source of a quantum computer's awesome power, but also as a crucial feature of exotic quantum phases of matter, vital element of quantum structure of space time itself. 21st century physics will advance not only by probing the short distance frontier of uh, particle physics and the long distance frontier of cosmology, but also by exploring the entanglement frontier by elucidating and exploiting the properties of increasingly quantum systems. Okay. And so he says that, you know, how the history of physics would have been different if there had been no John Bell. He claims that, you know, all these other things we saw in 1964 could have been done by others, but it's not obvious that which contemporary of Bell, if any, would have discovered the inequality in Bell's absence. So this kind of summarizes to you, you know, how uh, this thing sort of evolved from theory to experiment to technological applications. OK, coming to, uh, you know, uh, the legged garg part of the story. So this was basically to tell you about, uh, uh, you know, other, of course, uh, popular ways in which one can test uh, realism, right? Legged actually asks this very interesting question. Does nature differentiate between quote unquote micro and macro? OK, 
in fact, this was what was thought to be the thing, you see. So Bohr, in fact, was also, uh, you know, of the opinion that, you know, there is the micro and then, of course, uh, the measurements and all are done by macro. And so we need to understand, you know, this is micro, that is my macro, and then things get resolved in the head. However, as pointed out by Schrodinger in 1935 in his famous cat paper that you're all familiar with, I suppose the Schrodinger cat is a quite a popular, um, you know, example. There is no good reason to accept this division of the world into a microscopic regime where quantum mechanics reigns and a macroscopic one governed by classical physics. Because quantum mechanics is a very totalitarian theory. And if it applies to individual atoms and electrons, then it should prima facie equally apply to the macroscopic objects made up of them, right? Including any devices which we have set up at as measuring apparatus. So this is basically the question that uh, led Leggett and uh, you know his then postdoc Anupam Garg to come up with this alternative approach and alternative inequality which would lead to whose violation will also violate realism but then uh, from a very different uh, you know perspective okay so there are now these two key notions of our everyday macroscopic world here we have just discussed about local realism local realist inequalities which is an example is a bell inequality and then, you know, bipartite systems or multipartite systems where, you know, these things could be tested. And of course, it has been done and uh, the violations show uh, the violation of local realism. But then we come to this thing about what happens in the macroscopic world. OK, and so in macroscopic world to probe these concepts uh, comes this concept of macro realism, which I will discuss as we go along. And we have these macro realist inequalities. And the important thing to remember here is that here we are actually testing uh, the notion of realism in a single system. Here we need these, uh, you know, bipartite or multipartite systems, right? Because these are entangled systems. So we are testing Bell inequality. So you need this um, correlation between two or more parties. But here, but then of course, you know, you should also be able to come up with a test of testing realism for single systems, which of course can exist in superposition. Superposition principle is a fundamental principle in quantum mechanics and a single system can exist in a superposition of macroscopically distinct states. And so these legate guard uh, and related inequalities actually deal with testing realism in such systems. OK, so just to summarize the Bell's inequality and its variance, they give you a testable algebraic consequence of the combination of the notions of realism and locality, which of course is incompatible with quantum mechanics. The legged garg inequality and its variance give you again a testable algebraic consequence, but of the combination of realism and something else that is called non-invasive measurability, uh, which again I will discuss as we go along, which is also incompatible with quantum mechanics. And this together, realism and NIM, they are called macro realism. Okay. So legged garg inequality. So this is uh, Anthony Leggett and this is Anupam Garg. Okay, so a legged guard inequality is actually a temporal analog of Bell's inequality. So in Bell's inequality, you have the spatial separation, right? So you deal with locality that forms a very fundamental part of uh, testing uh, the Bell inequalities, local realism. So quantum mechanics is non-local, but here you have a temporal analog of Bell's inequality in terms of time separated correlation functions, because here you're dealing with a single system as it is evolving in time. So time separated correlation functions corresponding to successive measurement outcomes for a system whose state evolves in time. So it's a temporal analog of Bell. OK, so the notion of realism is invoked in deriving like a inequality by assuming that a system during its time evolution is at any given time in a definite one of the macroscopically separated available states. So essentially it's a superposition. So it could be either here or there. So I mean, you know, in one of two possible states it can occupy and then it is evolving in time and we are measuring correlations in time. Okay. And non-invasive measurability is assumed, as I mentioned. What does it mean? It means exactly what it states, that in principle, it is possible to determine which of the states the system is in without affecting the state itself or the system subsequent dynamics. So you have to do this in a way that your measurement is not invasive, this particular measurement, that so that you do not affect the state or its subsequent dynamics by doing this measurement. This is an important assumption that needs to be satisfied. And I'll tell you how we have done this by using two different schemes in our experiment. Okay. So once you uh, satisfy this assumption, then you can basically test the concept of realism in Leggett-Garg for a single system. Okay. 
Now, the original motivation for LGI was to use it for probing the possible limits of quantum mechanics in the mesoscopic or macroscopic regime. Yeah? Example experiments involving the RF squid device and so on. So this was the original motivation to sort of see how uh, basically have a test for the classical quantum boundary as you keep on increasing the, uh, you know, the size of the system, so to speak. However, and I mean, these are all examples of experiments in which uh, this has been probed. For instance, you can see these various experiments with increasing size of molecules and so on and so forth. Okay. In recent years, the quantum mechanical violation of LGI and its implications have been extensively studied for various types of microsystems to pro uh, probe their non-classicality, okay? ranging from solid state qubits to nuclear spins to electrons, photons, NV centers, what have you. Okay? And so basically it, the focus has shifted, although that still remains a, a, an important focus to you know, keep increasing the uh, macroscopic uh, you know, literal you know, size and exploring how far you can take that. But then the Leggett-Garg inequality is now being used in recent times in microscopic systems to probe the non-classicality of these systems because then, of course, this is a foolproof test of non-classicality. If you do that, then you can actually, uh, you know, uh, use this for various applications. And so all these particles then come in. And all this, of course, is without involving the notion of locality. This is what makes it fundamentally different from the uh, Bell inequalities, right? Because it's a temporal analog of Bell. Which brings us to what we have done, which is, of course, a loophole free interferometric test of macrorealism using heralded single photons. Okay, And this work was done in collaboration with Professor Deepankar Holm, who is currently in the audience, uh, Debashi Shaha, who uh, is a postdoc at SN Bose Center, and uh, Koshik Jawardar, who was my PhD student at that time. Okay. Now, what are the key features of our experiment? First of all, this is the first loophole free experiment wherein both the Leggett-Garg inequality and what is called the Wigner form of the Leggett-Garg inequalities have been decisively violated. And I will tell you what they are and why doing them both is important. And uh, the WLGI has never been tested experimentally before this. Okay? And why loophole free is important is also something I will go on to explain. It is a comprehensive refutation of the classical realist worldview, along with measurements that are ensured to be non-invasive. As I mentioned, that's a crucial point. We have perfect matching of these observed violations with quantum mechanical predictions, incorporating experimental non-idealities. Again, such this has not been analyzed in earlier such experiments. Okay. And we then provide a powerful platform for harnessing this most general, unambiguous signature of the non-classicality of single photon states towards various information theoretic applications, wherein the single photon is, of course, a ubiquitous workhorse. Okay. Okay. So now, we go on to what is what is this thing about loophole free? Of course, we have discussed Bell inequality. We have discussed, you know, how the Leggett-Garg is related to the Bell and not quite, and you know what the violation would actually entail. But what is this thing about loophole free, which is of course the main focus of our experiment? It is the first loophole free violation of the Leggett-Garg inequality. Okay, and so what is loophole free now? What we are talking about is that we are saying that, you know, we have this inequality, we are doing these various joint probability measurements, and by, you know, uh, doing the relevant measurements, we are violating the inequality. But then, of course, in order to claim this in the most comprehensive way, you have to ensure that there are no ambiguities in your experiment. Of course, that is necessary in any experiment, but in this case, it is even more important because these ambiguities can give you a false violation. Okay. So you are actually testing violation using the setup and so on. But then if there are certain ambiguities or loopholes in your experiment, as they're called, and I'll discuss these loopholes as well, then this gives a, raises a question mark that, you know, uh, is this violation actually real or is it because of this particular ambiguity which they weren't quite able to address? Okay. And so for these violation experiments, uh, closing these ambiguities is extremely important. And while we saw, you know, the experiments related to Bell started in the 70s, 80s and so on, only in 2015, three groups simultaneously uh, reported loophole-free violation of Bell inequality. Uh, this uh, was an experiment done by uh, the Hansen group, which was using electron spins. Okay. Then the Zeilinger group, uh, which was using entangled photons. And uh, Krista Sham and uh, Paul Kuyat and others, again, using entangled photons. So all these three papers appeared simultaneously 
uh, in 2015. Okay, and so this is uh, the amount of time it took to perform loophole-free violations of the Bell inequality. And in fact, that is why our experiment, you know, uh, uh, will uh, be an important contribution to this uh, important, very important field with a lot of legacy. Uh, because it is the first loophole free violation of the legged garg inequalities, which is a temporal um, counterpart of the bell, right? And so, and of course, in our case, we don't have two more groups who have also declared the same results in the same year. So we are definitely the first and we are very happy about that. So why is a loophole free test such an important achievement? I and mean, this was summarized beautifully in this Physics Today article, which was written on these three loophole free bell tests, okay? Well, first of all, you know, of course, uh, they tell you about, uh, you know, whether quantum mechanics is real and complete and, you know, any remaining doubts about that are uh, also sat there, you know, quenched. But they develop new capabilities in quantum information and security. A loophole free Bell test demonstrates not only that particles can be entangled at all, but also that a particular source of entangled particles is working as intended and hasn't been tampered with. So applications include perfectly secure quantum key distribution and unhackable sources of truly random numbers. And by now performing the first loophole free experiment on the legged garg, we then open up the field towards such applications using legged garg inequality. So that is why this is uh, uh, an important achievement. Okay. Now, why both LGI and WLGI? And before that, what are, you know, these, this is how the inequalities look. So I showed you the form for the bell. This is for the legged garg. So, you know, you have these essentially, you can see here. So this is the system, it is evolving in time. So I'm measuring these dichotomic uh, observables, Q at different time instances, T1, T2, T3, okay? And so I'm measuring this expectation value of these uh, joint probabilities. So there are many joint probabilities, sub probabilities in this. So this is QT1, QT2 expectation plus QT2, T3 expectation minus the expectation value of QT1, QT3. And each of them, of course, have uh, four possibilities, sub possibilities. So those are the joint probabilities. Okay. And from the macro list uh, considerations, this is less than or equal to one. So this is the legged garg inequality that the sum and difference of these uh, dichotomic uh, observables uh, expectation value is less than or equal to one. And if you employ quantum mechanics, this bound becomes 1.5, similar to the two and the two root two that we are aware of in the Bell scenario. The, the Wigner form of the legged garg inequality is actually something that was derived here. And uh, in this one, uh, it uses a sub ensemble that already participates in this, where we talk about joint probabilities and essentially, uh, you know, marginal probabilities. And uh, this is also an interesting form. And this has, it's less than or equal to zero for the macro realist bound and the quantum mechanical bound is 0.5. Now, both LGI and WLGI are necessary, but not sufficient conditions of macro realism. Hence, simultaneous violation provides a more robust violation of the notion of macro realism. Okay? This is one reason why this doing both of them uh, was important. And as I mentioned, the WLGI has not been experimentally tested before. And this WLGI expression involves a significantly lower number of measurable joint probabilities compared to the number of measurable joint probabilities in the LGI expression, thus making it a more experimentally friendly parameter prone to less error and hence a better match with QM predictions. And of course, for experimentalists, we would always like to, you know, um, deal with a quantity which has less number of terms for obvious reasons, because then less error. So that also, that advantage also the WLGI uh, offers. Okay, and so we have done both uh, for this reason. This was the experimental proposal. And of course, you know, we have done the experiment. Why I say this is a proposal, because our experiment is slightly different in the way it looks from this particular way, but this is an one which is much easier to understand. Okay, so this consists of, as you can see, a concatenated Mark Zender interferometers, and what uh, you know, there is a single particle. It is incident on the first beam splitter. It can, of course, take the upper path or the lower path, and so this upper path and the lower path are the two possible values of this dichotomic uh, observable. Okay, so the upper path uh, we call it minus one and the lower one is plus one. Okay. And the time between the first and second beam splitter is T1. Similarly, the time between the second and third beam splitter is T2, and the time after the third beam splitter is T3. And so we have minus one, plus one, plus one, minus one, minus one, plus one. So these are the various possibilities, okay? 
And now, and of course, we also have phase shifters. And I won't get into the details of this because, of course, this phase shifter plays an important role in the quantum mechanical uh, calculation. And, uh, you know, we also pay a lot of attention to the beam splitter splitting ratios because we've actually come up with an experiment where we choose splitting ratios so that we can see uh, the maximum violation. OK, and that is not 50 50. In fact, this beam splitter splitting ratio is 80 is to 20 in our experiment. Theoretically, it works out to 75 is to 25. Just like in Bell, you know, by using certain settings, you get the maximum two root two. Here, by using different splitting ratios of the beam splitter, you have that analogous uh, maximum violation. Okay. Now, what is the macroscopicity here? This is a question that you may ask because, you know, we, we are talking about macro realism. So, and we're talking about single photons. But as I told you earlier, the macroscopicity is not just related to the mass of the system. It essentially is a parameter whereby you know you can easily distinguish between the two states of the superposition and so in this case it is characterized by the ratio of the spatial separation of the two arms of the interferometer to the wavelength of the photon and this spatial separation is in the centimeter domain where the wavelength is of course 810 nanometer so that gives us a macroscopicity of around 1.2 times 10 to the 4 which is very large so this macroscopicity is actually very context dependent in our case, it is given by this ratio of these length scales in the, you know, the, the famous experiment using the squid device, you know, superconducting quantum inter interference device. It, it is basically the, you know, difference in magnetic moments of the clockwork and a clockwise and anti-clockwise path and so on. So you essentially define the macroscopicity parameter according to the uh, experiment that you're doing and the system that you're using. In our case, it is the, this is the clear distinction between the upper path and the lower path and the ratio okay and as i have mentioned of course many times that what we have done is an experiment where we have either closed or circumvented almost all the loopholes we'll never say all of them because you can always come up with some loophole but then these are the standard loopholes and there has been no experiment so far which has closed or circumvented all of them together okay and in fact the detection efficiency loophole has not even been discussed in lgi experiments uh, till our experiment so these are the various loopholes and I'll give you a little detail as we move along. We have the clumsiness loophole. We have the detection efficiency loophole. We have multi photon emission loophole, coincidence loophole and preparation state loophole. And we have actually closed or circumvented all of them at the same time. OK, which brings me to the clumsiness loophole. And this is the one which is actually uh, very interesting to discuss and understand. Uh, as I have mentioned that, you know, we need this non invasive measurability in our experiment. And one way of doing this non-invasive measurability is what is called a negative result measurement. Okay, So a negative result measurement is one in which the outcome is inferred when the detection is detector is not triggered. So basically you have a detector in one of the arms and it of course gets triggered for some events, but you only count those where the detector is not triggered. So in a sense, you know, it is a negative result. So it's a, when it's not triggered is what you call a measurement. And of course, that is a natural way of doing this non-invasive thing because it's, the detector is not even there. So naturally, the this is one way in which you can motivate a non-invasive measurement. OK, and so NRM is employed to satisfy NIM, you know, so that any violation of the inequality can then be solely attributed to the violation of realism. OK, but measurements are inherently invasive. Even if you know I'm doing a negative result measurement, but somehow still it is a measurement. So measurements cannot be completely non-invasive. So now this non-idealness of the negative result measurement can result in classical disturbance that can lead to a false violation. So as I mentioned, these loopholes are important because these loopholes can actually lead, lead to false, if they exist, can lead to false violations of the inequality in, uh, that is of interest. And then, of course, you are uh, then the result is not quite right. And so this sort of thing in which this classical disturbance leads to a false violation because of the non idealness of the non negative result measurement is called the clumsiness loophole. It's essentially, you know, being clumsy. So in spite of your best efforts, there is some invasiveness left. And so what do you do about it? And so that is the loophole which we call the clumsiness loophole. And this is what essentially is meant, you know, diagrammatically by the negative result measurement. So, you know, here I have the plus one and the minus one, right? So now if I want to measure, measure P, T2, P3 plus plus, I would essentially put the detector in the minus one path, okay? So which means that I'm only detecting this 
or that. So this is the plus plus, this is the plus minus. Okay. So by putting a detector here, I'm eliminating the minus possibility. And so I'm only detect, whatever I detect is going to come from these events. This is what we mean by a negative result measurement. So the detector is here, but I'm actually concerned with what is happening where the detector is not there, which is here, right? So now one of the ways in which, I, so we have done negative result measurement in our experiment and uh, this blocker thing I'll come to soon. That is also one thing we have done, which will be interesting when we get to the detection efficiency loophole. But then now, coming back to the clumsiness loophole. Yeah. Uh, yes, Akshay. Sorry, I can't, uh, I didn't hear you. Can you repeat yeah, me? You, uh, 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 you have about five minutes. In the ah, okay. Okay, so then I will, uh, I will take 10. <laughs> Okay. If that is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah sounds. Uh, yeah. So I'll uh, speak about the next part uh, very briefly and uh, finish this one uh, properly. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. So now, as I was saying, in the clumsiness loophole, okay, uh, what we have done is, you know, other than the negative result measurements, we have also done what is called, you know, satisfying the no signaling in time condition. What is no signaling in time? It is a choice of measurement at any any instant does not affect the statistical results of any measurement at a later instant. And this, of course, is a natural way of satisfying NIM. So if I can uh, ensure that uh, this happens, then of course this will provide a nice bound to how well I have satisfied NIM. And these are the no signaling in time relations, okay, where you can see that this uh, measurement at T2 is an equal sum of the T1, T2 and uh, for plus and the minus. So this actually is the algebraic way of, uh, these are the ones which we have satisfied. Okay. So, and of course, this is the experiment where we have done these measurements, but instead of a single run, we have done three experimental runs for these three quantities of interest by satisfying the relevant no signaling in time conditions. And by doing that, we have actually bounded our non-invasive measurability to 10 to the minus two, which is very important. Okay. The second loophole, as I mentioned, was the fair sampling loophole or the detection efficiency loophole. This is the assumption that all detection efficiencies are 100%, which is what uh, you know we can assume in theory, but in reality, this is not the case. And so in reality, there can be you know, a problem that you know, the photons which are not getting detected can you know, conspire to uh, give you a false violation, which in fact is not there. Okay. And so then this is what is meant by a fair sampling. So this is an assumption that the sampling is fair, but how do you know it? And so what we have done is, you know, we have calculated the minimum detection efficiency that is required for the LGI and WLGI. So only above 85% and 78% would we actually violate realism uh, properly. Otherwise it could be explained by a local hidden variable model, but we have done better. What we have done is we have modified our measurement strategy so that you know this is the uh, quantity of interest so that instead of using a detector here we have replaced it by a perfect blocker which is in fact a hundred percent efficiency detector so by putting in a blocker here we have actually detected only at the end so detectors are fixed at t3 we have used a blocker here instead of a detector and by assuming this arrow of time which means that you know uh, something in the future cannot affect what is uh, there in the past we have actually been able to show, and this is a very detailed derivation which is there in our paper, please have a look if you're interested, that we are able to show uh, violation, uh, you know, we are able to close this detection efficiency loophole for any non-zero detection efficiency, not just above 85 and 78. So detection efficiency loophole thus is irrelevant in this context. Okay? And so this is how we have circumvented it. Then there is the other one, which is called the multi-photon emission loophole. And this is a very simple one, which means that, you know, we have of course assumed that we have a single photon in the experiment, but suppose we didn't. Then there is a parameter gamma, which we have defined, which is a fraction of the total set of runs that corresponds to the occurrence of two photons within our experimental setup. And we have modified the inequalities by taking the gamma parameter. We have measured the gamma parameter experimentally and shown, uh, you know, that this is actually only at the third decimal place. And this is the change that it brings about in the uh, inequality uh, expressions. Instead of one, it is 1.0046, and instead of zero, it's 0 0.0012. So in fact, uh, you know, this changed upper bound is so, uh, you know, small in the third decimal place that we can in fact ignore uh, this loophole in our experiment. Similarly, we have also dealt with a few more loopholes, which I won't get into the details too because of lack of time. But then basically, it gives you an idea about how we have dealt with each and every loophole by 
modifying the you know experiment in a way that we can either close it or circumvent it and this has not been done before okay. this is the actual schematic as i mentioned it's different because we have replaced the second mark zender by using by a display saniac interferometer because of the inherent phase stability that it has okay and these are experiments where people have closed clumsiness loophole but while it has this clumsiness loophole has been addressed in many earlier experiments the other loopholes have not garnered much attention especially the detection efficiency loophole that has played a critical role in analysis of many bell violation experiments uh, but not been dealt with in earlier lgi ones okay and so this is our results so this you can see is, is very nice so these are our experimentally measured values where you can see our we have 1.32 plus minus 0.04 0.004 uh, which is in fact eight times what you would expect from macrorealism and the WLGI is five times what you would expect from macrorealism. Okay? And these are the quantum mechanically predicted values. And this is actually a very important part of our experiment that other than the theory element of you know, predicting what would happen from quantum mechanics, we have actually taken both systematic as well as random errors all all of them have been taken into account to come up with bounds for the quantum mechanical expectations as well because experiments are never ideal and so your quantum mechanical prediction is also based on these uh, specific you know various components in your experiment so we've taken all of them into account and come up with this bound and you can see that the experiment matches beautifully with the quantum mechanically predicted value with the experimental non-ideality and this is how we have satisfied the nsit as i mentioned that was an important part for the non-invasive measurability. And this is, you know, some pictures that we have with Tony Leggett and my collaborator here uh, when he had come to visit us when we were in the process of doing this experiment. Okay, so the next five minutes that I have, I will give you a very brief bird's eye overview of the second part, which was anyway meant to be shorter if I had to do justice to this part. Hopefully I have uh, been able to convey something to you about this beautiful experiment that we have done on leggett garg is on the higher dimensional uh, quantum uh, information uh, again using interference as a tool okay so why is higher dimension interesting and this is an example that you would appreciate that you know in higher dimensions which means basically non qubit systems so instead of using two level systems we are using three or higher level systems okay and so basically you can pack in a lot more information using smaller number of systems so here if you have a four level system you have uh, you know only one but for uh, same information, you need two qubits, right? So instead of this two to the 50, which everybody is after, we can make it three to the 33 or four to the something. So the exponent drops while giving you the access to the same state space dimensionality. And so essentially pack in more information using smaller number of systems. And what we have in our lab is a beautiful system, which we have generated using photons of spatially correlated Q trips. Okay, and this technique of generating Q trips is also something we have devised uh, for the first time, and you'll find details in this paper. Uh, essentially, and, and the, this is previous work in the spatial Q did domain, but not using the same technique that we have, which is basically called pump beam modulation, where we have modulated the pump beam in down conversion and you know given it a structure which the uh, single photons carry through and in fact also carry through the inherent correlations. So instead of you know, placing apertures in the path of the photons, we have modulated the pump beam itself. Okay? And uh, this is what I, so this is the uh, pump profile and this is the single port photon profile. And this, uh, you know, the first paper where we measured these beautiful correlations, one, one, two, two, three, three correlations with a very high correlation coefficient of 0.9. Okay? But of course, you know, uh, these correlations are uh, interesting, they are there. And in that paper, we showed that they are not there for the pump photons. They are only there for the single photons. But then are these correlations quantum? And in fact, the recent work that we have done, which now you will have to definitely go and read up because I'll be discussing it in one minute, is uh, telling you that they are. And not only have we shown that they are entangled, we have come up with a new way of measuring this entanglement. Okay? So we have derived a monotonicity relation between negativity, which as you know, is a measure of entanglement, and the sum of its Pearson correlation coefficients, which is a statistical correlation measure. So monotonicity relations between entanglement measures and statistical correlation measures. Statistical correlation measures we measure all the time. So by measuring something which we measure all the time, we are able to actually derive the exact amount of entanglement that this system has which in contrast to quantum state tomography based approaches where you know the number of measurements scales to d square 
So for a three cross three system, it would be something like of the order of 80 measurements. We do it by using one set of measurements. OK, similarly for negativity and some of mutual predictabilities as well as now entanglement of formation, which is an entanglement measure and mutual information for arbitrary dimensions. OK, and so we have also done the first direct measurement of an entanglement monotone experimentally in the lab. Earlier it was always derived from quantum state tomography. Here we have been directly able to measure it and we have shown that negativity and entanglement of formation are non equivalent entanglement measures, which is very non trivial. OK, and this is also the first experimental demonstration of this non equivalence. And these are the two papers which you are welcome to have a look at for details of the theory and the experiment which I just discussed. These are the relations that I was talking about. This is negativity and this is some of various statistical correlation measures. OK, and I'll skip the details. These are the, how the profiles look. This is the coincidence profile of the focal plane, which is interference pattern, which tells you it already certifies entanglement but we have actually quantified it by our own new uh, method that we have devised. OK, now we're working on different protocols using this uh, theory and experiment, and we are really excited about what the future holds for this uh, genre of work that we are doing. OK, and this is a snapshot of various papers from our lab in this domain, if you're interested. And for students, uh, this is a popular you know, article that I was invited to write where I've actually talked uh, in detail uh, you know, a holistic uh, picture of this higher dimensional quantum information processing that we are doing. So with that, hopefully Akshay, I was almost on time. So I would like to thank you again for this opportunity. And these are from the celebrations that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago of our lab turning 10. OK, and so uh, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Urbasi. Uh, uh, the cake also looks very nice. <laughs> <laughs> it does, and Thanks for the fantastic talk. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Uh, Vivek, please go ahead. So should I stop yeah. sharing screen or should I have this in this mode, uh, Akshay? Uh, you can you can keep the keep the screen. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah because okay. uh, people might want certain. Yeah, screen. sure, sure, sure. Okay, yeah, thank you, Urvasi. I'm Vivek from ISC. Very stimulating yeah. talk. Uh, I had a uh, I'm completely new to the field of quantum optics, so maybe my question is irrelevant, but uh, so I had a question about the first part of the talk where you showed, you know, two sort of coupled Mark Zender interferometers right. and, and later you had mentioned that you replaced one of them with a Saniac for phase stability. So right. I guess my question was, uh, um, I, I'm assuming that these are not phase stable interferometers. So uh, the question is, uh, how much do you think, uh, let, let us say if they were phase stabilized, then hmm. how much do you think uh, that improves the measurement? And then uh, let's say if they were not phase stabilized, then hmm. uh, do you think they affect the? Uh, you showed those four different or three Absolutely. different terms, like joint probability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They very they much the ratios. Vivek, you're not from the field apparently, but you asked an excellent question. So I mean, in fact, there is a whole page on this in the paper, by the way. OK, so uh, this one is the experiment that we have done, as I mentioned. So what you can see here, you know, this display Saniac, if you can see now my pointer, hmm. What happens is that you know this is one of the uh, you know parts yeah. and this is the other one right yeah, so right. as you can see both of them they base this is closed loop so whatever yeah. will, will affect it you know in one of them the same yeah. effect will happen in the other so that is how yeah, this yeah. gets nullified okay but now in spite of this and of course you know if we had a mark zender version then we would have to do phase stabilization using exactly, feedback right. and so on which we didn't want to really get into because it would add to the complexity of an already rather complex setup right mm -hmm. but then what you what we see is you know ideally what we would have liked is that I, I told you about this theta parameter which I skipped because you know it was too much detail but there is the this phase theta parameter. Parameter. yeah the phase shifter so we assume that it is actually zero because uh, uh, for that we get the maximum violation but then in reality that would mean that the interference visibility that we have for this uh, interferometer should have been 100 percent. OK, sure. but then it is not really 100 percent. So in fact, it goes with varies between 70 to 85 percent our visibility. And in fact, that uh, you know that range, you know, that I showed you about this quantum mechanical prediction with the error range in uh -huh. this 70 to 85 percent actually has been fed into that. This is one of the contributors uh, that in spite of all your efforts, you know, you will still not get it to be perfectly collinear. Neither will you know your and these things like this NPBS also have a little polarization dependence. So all these errors come in and so the visibility is not 100 and we have actually observed it extensively and our range is 70 to 85 and that feeds into our error calculation. Okay. So essentially the fringe depth uh, decreases, but I was also wondering if 
uh, you know, like the three, I think there were three terms in the joint uh, yeah. probability yeah. inequality. Uh, I was just wondering, does do these things affect, let's say, phase instabilities? Uh, do these things yeah. affect relative ratios of these terms? Another, as well? another, actually, very good question. So now, something that I did not say a lot because you see, already I ran out of time a little bit, is you know this. Uh, so let me just go to the <laughs> other more friendly picture because that one is easier to just one moment. Uh, yeah, so you know we're talking about T1, T2, T2, T3, and T1, T3, right? But then yes. one thing that I did not mention uh, in the earlier this is that this first one we actually uh, you know set it up in a way that the result is not uh, an interference. Okay, so here we have a macroscopic part difference between these two, so that we only use it to um, an, um, anoint the minus one and plus one. This is all we are interested in here. It is only the output of the second interferometer where the interference effects come in which of course lead to the violation, right? So here we just define the superposition. Here we have the violation. So in fact, when we do the T1, T2, T2, T3, and T1, T3 measurements, uh, only the ones which involve the, uh, you know, so there is only one term which actually involves the interference term, and the other two are non-interference terms in those uh, terms that I showed separately. So in fact, uh, we actually went into a lot of statistical analysis to uh, find that the, in order to measure the interference terms, we need more repetitions of the experiment for that uh, to be statistically real. In fact, 300 runs of the experiment, whereas for the non-interfering ones, it's 150. And so we did a bootstrap analysis uh, to show that there is a convergence below 10 to the minus two for these numbers. And so that uh, that is why uh, you're absolutely right that the interference terms definitely require more statistics than the non-interference ones. And in fact, this visibility, as I mentioned, and in fact, since you asked this question, this NSIT that I showed you, where did that go? This NSIT conditions that I, yeah. So the third NSIT condition is actually, it's also only the, I'll just show you the result once that will make it a little more clear. Just one moment, please. Yeah, so you can see these two are zero. Uh, you know, because they don't depend on the interference. Okay, whereas this guy changes a little bit from the zero prediction because it depends on the interference. This T2, T3 actually does, and so uh, this all goes in uh, sure. to these various terms. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. You're most welcome. Uh, Anand, please go ahead with your question. Yeah. Hi. So I'm from Miser, yeah. and my question is that uh, how following this condition of uh, negative result or the ideal negative measurement with the two time NSIT condition mm. ensures that we that we have exhausted all possible microrealist theory. Right. Yeah. So so I didn't explain it a lot in detail again for lack of time. So I just go to that particular slide. Okay, this one, yeah. So essentially, as I mentioned, you know, so first of all, of course, the non, I, I hope you got the idea of negative result measurements. So that is essentially uh, taking yes. only those runs into account where you don't actually have a measurement. But then uh, having said that, how do you know that, you know, uh, you know, this T1, T2 does not affect some something in the past does not some invasiveness that may, you may have still introduced because ultimately it's still a measurement. Some invasiveness that you may have introduced does not affect the future uh, um, time. You know that is uh, something which still remains even with NRM. It still remains. So now this no signaling in time. You know this is this uh, actually is an equivalence which has been shown theoretically that this statistical form of this non-invasive measurability exactly maps to no signaling in time. So which means that, you know, if you do this, so as I, as I showed you, so when you do this T1, T2, um, you're measuring this particular term, uh, which is a part of the Leggett-Garg inequality, right? You are also satisfying this no signaling in time and the satisfaction of no signaling in time essentially means that you're not signaling uh, in, in time. So this does not affect this and this does not affect that. OK, so by satisfying the relevant NSITs as you go along, you are actually uh, bounding. Pardon, pardon, pardon. You understood, right? So that, yeah. that happens so, only statistically, isn't it? Statistically, in, yeah. In and a this given is like, run, of course, uh, one yeah, yeah. could still. Great. That is, a, that is a, a question that a referee had. OK, so that's again a very nice question. So in a given run, you could. And that is where uh, this thing comes in. And in fact, please have a look at our paper. We kind of spent a lot of time in discussing this. So you see, if you 
if you say okay you know statistically it happens but maybe individually it doesn't but then you have to come up with a, um, a hidden variable model of course you know you have to come up with a hidden variable model which will explain this then right and so then it has to be such that you know it uh, you know sort of conspires in a way that it um, you know the it it sort of doesn't do the right thing for t1 t2 t2 t3 as well as t1 t3 so i mean you know essentially because we have three of them that we are satisfying uh, you know for the three uh, separate runs it is actually very difficult to come up with a model like that where you know um, you know a local realist model you can come up with where you know all these three are simultaneously somehow conspiring and statistically they are giving you something and individually they are not and in fact this is called this collusion loophole okay uh, if you have read this you know mark wildy and others have this very nice paper where they have actually said that uh, and they call this the adroitness condition so essentially I mean, as the word indicates that you know it is extremely improbable let's say that this would happen all three will sort of do this and statistically go and do something else and so having three of them kind of gives you uh, um, you know better reassurance that you are sort of you know not doing something uh, statistically different and individually different but we actually have said you know uh, that uh, it is it is improbable but perhaps not impossible you can, maybe uh, somebody can come up with a model where this can happen but at least in the current scenario this is the best we have been able to do with the 10 to the minus 2 bound yeah Okay, and and so yeah. so so sorry, yeah. So yes. I had this another thing with where uh, people now like uh, Bruckner and Koffler, these people have considered like using three yes, yes, yes. time NSIT condition, and somehow they are uh, 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 ensuring that this that, that is a much stronger condition of uh, right, right, uh, right. non massive measurability. So yeah, uh, yeah. So that is why yeah. I was. Uh, yeah, so you know, that know that. Was, again, a, a very nice observation. So, in fact, uh, as we, uh, we have also pointed this out in our paper, so see, we wanted to do an experiment where we are violating LGI and using the satisfaction of NSIT as a tool for non invasive measurability. So, mm -hmm. in our setup, we are not going to be able to show the uh, three time NSIT violation. Uh, 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 as well as this two time NSIT satisfaction in some sense. So the particular way in which we have done the experiment, we cannot do both. So what we have chosen to do is we have actually chosen to satisfy NSIT uh, and violate LGI and WLGI. This three time uh, doesn't lend itself to, I mean, at least the way the setup is currently, we cannot do both, okay? Because, uh, the, yeah, but then of course, in a future experiment, we would, uh, try to you know address the three time uh, NSIT as because that is, as you say this Koffler Bruckner paper is very interesting but then here we have not uh, you know usually what people would say uh, you know in in those uh, genre they would say that the violation of NSIT is also uh, you know uh, of course violating realism right that is another way of violating realism. NSIT is also something you can violate but here we have chosen to satisfy the two time NSITs knowingly so that our violation of LGI is uh, you know, somewhat stronger uh, because mm -hmm. we have an no, alternative way of satisfying NIM. Uh, so we have not concentrated on uh, uh, using violation of NSIT in this experiment because as I said, we cannot do both in the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then definitely uh, uh, something very interesting also to uh, look at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank you. Nice talk. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? So, Dipankar, please go ahead. Hello, just a comment to add yes, with respect to the previous question, just sure. to clarify a bit more that the full focus here, the NSIT has been used conditions as Ubushi has stressed repeatedly as a tool for ensuring non-invasiveness. While in the koffler Bruckner paper or all those studies on NSIT, the focus is on using NSIT as a means for testing macrobialism per se. Yeah. Or in that context, it becomes important to have necessary to test all the NSITs, he has right, rightly mentioned. Uh, so that is in that context. But here in our context, the role of NSIT is uh, fundamentally different from that in the Kofner-Buchner paper. 
Right. So, so the question of necessary and sufficient does not arise here. But of course, the question of how to close the uh, the, 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 the the impossibility are part of it, the collusion part of it. That would push you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, sure. Yogendra, please go ahead with your question. Sorry, I don't hear anything. Uh, Yogendra, please go ahead with your question. You're muted right now. Uh, Yogendra, we can't hear you. Uh, can you type your question instead? We cannot hear you. Okay, there seems to be a technical problem. Maybe uh, uh, Dr. Gendra, you can talk to um, see offline, or actually just talk to the talk online. <laughs> so, anyways. Uh, if there are no further questions, let's uh, thank uh, Rusi again for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Akshay, and thanks a lot, everyone, for listening. Bye. Thanks, Rusi, and hope to uh, see you in person. We come to yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, or you can visit us. <laughs> yes, I think yeah, we should do this while the thing lasts, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. See you then. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.